button. How about now? Thank you. Brilliant. So it's worked for us. Okay. Um, right. So in other words, lots of char is simply below the cutoff, right? So its prominence is, is something like 86 meters, and so it's below the 500 meter cutoff, and so it didn't make this list, right? But and and once you have this this sort of persistence diagram, this idea, and this this way of representing the data, then you can slice and dice it in different ways. For example, you can ask what are the most prominent peaks um, on Earth. Yeah, there you go, and you start getting what should be usual suspects, right? Namely, the highest points in different continents, right? Because if you're at the at the highest point in the continent, you have to descend all the way down to the ocean before you can climb up or something higher on a different continent. So you get Mount Everest, you get Aconcagua, the highest point in the, in the Americas, Mount Denali in the Alaska, Kilimanjaro in Africa, and so forth. Okay, so um, this is your you know three slide introduction to persistence. And um, if, if you look over how persistence has been used over the past, whatever it is, 20 years since it's been introduced, it's been very kind of descriptive. So it's, it's roughly this idea, but applied to, to lots of different kinds of data. Um, um, you know, we, we compute, we take some, some data, we compute this persistence diagram, and then we look at it, right? We look what are the, the, the points, what are the, the sort of these prominent peaks that it finds, or maybe we use some metrics to compare persistence diagrams and do some statistics. Or maybe we sort of vectorize them and feed them into machine learning algorithms, but it's all, it's all kind of uh, descriptive. And in the last uh, five years or so, there's been, sorry, this line, how did you choose this? I don't like that this slide is kind of, but um, I try, try to open the chat, maybe it's going to the chat. No, that's, uh, ah, brilliant. Okay, Pavel is the, is the expert. Um, so, so over the last five years or so, the, there's been kind of a new application, or type of application uh, introduced to TDA. Namely, it's uh, doing optimization using persistence as a loss. So if you can express some kind of a task that, that you want to, to solve, where that, that, that's formulated in terms of optimizing the moving points in the persistence diagram, um, you can modify your data to match whatever this task is prescribing. And I think this is a very exciting development because it opens up a whole bunch of possibilities, right? I mean, yesterday we saw Cheyenne's talk and Lakshmi's talk, this desire to somehow go back from, from the logical descriptor back to the data and figure out where, where things are coming from. And you can imagine that if you take a point and you start moving it around and see how the data changes, you can get the idea of what's, what's responsible for that point. It's a little bit... Um, Tricky to trace where, where, who, who introduced this first. So as far as I can tell, these three papers introduced this, this idea um, independently. So the first one was from 2016 by Gamiero, Hiroka, and Obayashi. So they, they interpolate between point clouds by taking the persistence diagram of one point cloud or another, moving the points in the diagram from one to the other, and then back propagating this to the data sort of to, to, to interpolate in the point clouds. Um, another idea, uh, this approach came from Fulinard, Shkab, and Asanikov, uh, where they solve lots of uh, geometry processing tasks, so manipulating meshes by doing the same kind of backpropagation. So you take two meshes, you take some function on them, you put one persistence diagram, another, now you can morph one mesh into the other, so these sort of usual tasks that graphics people like of moving a person from one pose to another by, by moving points in the persistence diagram and, and backpropagating. And um, yet another uh, approach or application came from Chao Chen and, uh, and co-authors, this is Yusuf Wang, uh, where they use uh, persistence as a regularizer. So the idea is that if you have some machine learning classifier and you want to prevent overfitting, you, you want a topologically simple boundary. And, and so you can, you can describe the topology of the boundary with the, with the persistence diagram, and then you can um, sort of simplify this boundary as part of the, of the of the training. So let me let me explain, and then there is a persistence implication which I'll come back to. Let me explain maybe just, just so that there are some more concrete um, examples, um, this sort of idea in some detail. So the, the kinds of examples of the losses that one could do, uh, for example, if you have a persistence diagram, you can say that I want to get rid of all the points that are closer than epsilon to the diagonal. And I will just define a loss that, that penalizes, so, so for every point that is closer than epsilon, I will just add a term that is death, death minus birth squared, right? And, and this, this will sort of try to push the points towards um, 
towards the diagonal. Um, another loss that that, that uh, Chen and colleagues were using um, is the idea that you want to simplify, get rid of all the points in a certain quadrant, which corresponds to the homology of a level set or sublevel set, depending on how you phrase it. And so, if you push push points out of the quadrant, then you, you will ensure that, that this sublevel set, level set, has a has a simple topology. And so, if your f, if your function f from which these persistence diagrams are coming, is not elevation on the earth, but for example, the response of some neural network, then getting rid of this uh, of these wrinkles, right? It, it's, it's a way to to, to regularize training. So just just as a to make it more concrete, if you have some you know a red point set and a blue point set, and you have some classifier that's trained on them that tells you that you know here you have red and here you have blue. So it really has some some function that it outputs. So imagine this is the output of neural network. Now if you have some outliers, your your function will your, your network can easily overfit by introducing these wrinkles, right? They, they try to go around the, the the outliers. And so if you if you if you Get rid of these wrinkles, right? You will you will avoid uh, overfitting. So if you do this for real data, well, not, not real data, but rather if you actually do this with the, with the real neural neural network. So here's an example um, that, that we tried. You take uh, three um, Gaussian, you have three clusters sampled from, from from Gaussians. Then you shuffle some labels. If you just train a vanilla kind of neural network on this, uh, it will learn. The outliers and it will overfit. So these, these, these are the points that are highlighted that are overfitted in bold. On the other hand, if you track during training when the overfitting started, so people do this with by, by tracking validation loss in, in machine learning, and then you hit it with this optimization. So you say, let's get rid of all the wrinkles in, in our uh, in our response. Then you get uh, the, this sort of picture on the right, which is um, well, there are fewer outliers, and I guess they make more sense, right? The green points are next to the um, next to the green cluster. So that's that's sort of the idea of, of how people have used or you can use topological optimization for machine learning. The other place that um, I think I think uh, this this is useful or, or sort of how this connects to past work, um, sort of shortly after persistence was introduced, uh, we posed this this idea of, of persistence sensitive simplification. So the idea is you have function f, uh, you're given some threshold epsilon, and you want to get rid of all the noisy features. So, so everything. That, that has persistence less than epsilon. So, so similar to the loss that I showed, so all these points need to be gone. Um, and so can you find a function G that is close to F that, that doesn't have these points? So in other words, a function that kind of flattens these spots out. Um, and and uh, when, when this question was posed, uh, we sort of answered it for extrema. So for, for dimension zero um, uh, features. Uh, and in fact, you can do this in, in linear time. But if you are interested in higher dimensional features, and particularly the middle dimensional features, then this is actually a very difficult problem to solve. And an easy way to see that this is a difficult problem to solve is that imagine that I, and it's sometimes impossible problem to solve, imagine that I give you a homology sphere, and I give you some function of it. This function will look like this, right? We'll have one uh, point of infinity in the zero dimensional diagram, one point of infinity in the three dimensional diagram, and then lots of finite points. Now, if I ask you to simplify all the finite points, right? Well, this would mean finding a function with just two critical points, which is of course impossible because this would mean that the domain is a sphere. So, in other words, no epsilon simplification can exist for a sufficiently high epsilon not. But in practice, I mean, this question is very interesting for the three sphere. So, if I give you a function on a three-dimensional domain, and now I ask you to simplify one-dimensional homology, this this comes up in applications a lot. I mean, we give this sort of technology in, in visualization. This is this is a an important question, but we actually don't know how, how, how to solve this, and it would be useful to, to have a solution. And you can imagine, I mean, again, if you think about this for a second, there are lots of obstructions, different kinds of obstructions that, that you can encounter, right? So if you have a, a, a circle, you know, attach a, a disk as a dance cap, right? Then suddenly you, you, you cannot, I mean, it's not collapsible, so you cannot define a um, discrete Morse function that is um, that, 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 that kills it, so you have to go somewhere higher. But you can approach this question, of course, kind of do your best best effort uh, approach by by using these ideas from from optimization. And so let me pause because I, I cannot quite tell if, if everything is okay. Yes, okay. I see one thumbs up. I see two thumbs up. Okay, I will interpret this as everything. Okay. okay. So so the way the way that people approach uh, optimization, oh, well, you know, I, I said that you can do this. Uh, the way that this actually works is uh, sort of the standard approach to optimization. Is that if you are given 
um, some simplicial complex K and you're given a function F on it, then every point in the persistence diagram, just from how the, the algorithms are defined, uh, is really comes from two pairs of simplices, right? Persistence really tells you that a class created by simplex sigma is killed by simplex tau. And so in the persistence diagram, if you have a point, it really means that it's F of sigma comma F of tau. And so if you want to move, if, if somehow your loss tells you that this point needs to move by some, some gradient GP, well, then this really just means that the values of F sigma and F tau need to be modified by the, by the coordinates of this, uh, of this vector. And then you can, however, whatever it generates your F, I mean, this could be some, you know, one of these standard Vitor strips construction or star filtration, anything, you can back propagate through that. And this gives you information about how to change your actual input data. That, that's responsible for this filtration, right? So it's it's, it's kind of as simple as, as it gets. So this this is why it keeps getting rediscovered by, by different people. Um, but this this has sort of a, a problem a limitation. It's um it's very really kind of inefficient. It requires taking lots of steps, and it's it's a very kind of circuitous thing uh, to do. So if you think about it, right? So suppose that here's my function. I have I have two points. I have this point, which corresponds to, to this to the pair of these two points. And now I want to push it to the diagonal, right? So the gradient tells me that you need to go this way. This translates into lifting this point a little bit and pushing this point a little bit down. If I take a single step, well, suddenly my function changed, you know, some new points popped up. Now the gradient tells me that this point suddenly starts, has to go down rather than up, right? So something strange starts happening. I take another step, things fix themselves, but I take another step. And now it's it's sort of it's very chaotic, it's very non-monotone, and sort of strange things are happening just by the virtue of that we're getting so little information back. Right? You take a step and um, things keep flip-flopping. Now momentum helps a lot, as it always does with optimization here, because it's sort of if a point is moving in one direction, it will keep moving in one direction. Uh, but but still it, it requires requires doing a lot of work. And there is a sort of I call this a standard approach, but this is almost the only approach. There's a kind of a dearth of algorithms for, for solving this uh, problem. And the only um, sort of non-trivial algorithm that, that, that exists that I know of um, was proposed just last year by Guigny, uh, Carrier, Lacan, and Nadeau. And um, the idea is roughly the following. So they observed that if you view your filtration as a function on Rn, where n is the number of simplices, and you know the value the, the, Point just represents the, the filtration, the, the values assigned to the simplices, then the space is stratified by the different orderings of the simplices, right? So on the one side, you know, tau one is less than tau two, tau, tau one greater than tau two, and then there are these lower dimension strata where the simplices become equal. Um, and if you just do naive gradient descent, sort of the reason that the things are slow is that you keep bouncing between strata, right? You, 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 start, you start in one place, you compute the gradient, you take a step, but suddenly the, the the order of the simplex has changed. So now a different simplex needs to move and needs to move down. And so you keep bouncing. And this also suggests why the great, why momentum helps. But yeah. um, and so they suggested this idea that what you can do is when you start at a point, or when you're sitting at, at, at a point in the space, you can sample the gradients on the nearby strata. This gives you a subgradient, sort of a degree of the comic style of, of, of gradients, and you can pick the direction of steepest descent among those. And then you follow that, and what this sort of translates into is that you you, you get to, to, to the stratum where, where tau one equals tau two, and you just you just keep keep going down. Um, now it's it's a little bit tricky to do because if you have k, so if, if your uh, co-dimension is not one but k, now you have you know, k plus one synthesis to worry about. You need to consider k plus one factorial orders in order to sample the strata. So you have to do something clever, they, they, and they do lots of clever things. So, so this is a great paper, and you know, you should take a look at it. Um, but that's that's the only thing that exists out there. And all of, uh, both the, the standard approach and this approach, um, it sort of treats persistence as a black box, right? It sort of I give you some some simplices, I give you a filtration, I have I get a pairing between these simplices, and that's all the information that I use. But of course, if you I mean. Many of you work with persistence, and you know that there's a lot more information under the hood. We're just not showing these persistence diagrams. So my goal in this talk is to open up this black box, but to do so, I need to restrict myself to a simpler case because, in general, it's, it's, it's just too complicated. Um, and so I will restrict myself to, to what I would call singleton loss. And um, the idea is the following: right, that any of virtually any loss that has been uh, suggested in the literature, 
I can think of it as a matching. So I have my input diagram in blue, and I have some target diagram in red. That that really just is, and, and the matching between the points, where, where it says that the blue point needs to move, move to the matched uh, red point. So when I when I was talking about simplification, right? If I want to get rid of all the points below the epsilon threshold, well, this really means that I take the blue points below the threshold and I match match them to the diagram. If I'm if I'm trying to simplify the, the quadrants or sublevel set, then I match the point to the nearest point outside the point. Right. So so that's that's kind of how you go from from a loss to, to to the matching. And so what what I want to consider in this talk is the simplest possible such such situation. Namely, I have a matching, but it's a partial matching with just a, a single pair uh, matched. So I have a blue diagram. I have one red point. So I have one blue point that needs to move somewhere. And in particular, I don't care what happens to the rest of the point. So one, for one point, they prescribe a target. And the rest of the points, you know, if they move in the process, then so be. I have a place no constraints. So I will call such a thing a single loss. Yeah? You don't keep the other points fixed. It's impossible to keep the other points fixed, right? So as I'm moving the blue point to the red point, other points will, will, will move in some way, but I place no, no constraints. Okay, so let's open the, the persistence black box. Um, by this, I mean that uh, the, the persistence pairing, oh, let me jump too far. Uh, the persistence pairing, right, the way the, way the algorithms of this, the, the, the standard VD reduction due to Edward Bruno Lecher and Zamarodian, the way this works is that you take, you have some simplicial complex, you have your filtration, so you take the boundary matrix of the simplicial complex, uh, you order the, the the rows and columns with respect to the filtration, then you reduce it. And you reduce it, meaning that you compute the matrix R such that the lowest non zeros are in unique rows of the um, yeah, in unique rows. Um, and it's, it's exactly these, these non zeros that give you the persistence pair, right? So if I have uh, the sigma is the lowest non zero in the column of tau, then there's a pair of sigma tau. And moreover, if you keep track of the how you, you computed this reduction, so how you computed from how you went from D to R, and you record uh, can record this information. You can think of this as a matrix decomposition. So it's R equals DV, or if you use U to denote the inverse of V, then D equals R U. Um, did this thing just go? Yeah. <laughs> first, first microphone of the day is down, right? Okay. Yes, yes, really. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so you can think you can think of a persistence computation as a, as a decomposition, and this is um, this is what's recorded in this R equals DV uh, picture. Um, and there is the kind of intuitive interpretation of all of this that it's useful to keep in mind. So if I have some function, so I think of this as a landscape, and I have my sigma is an edge that creates a, a, a one cycle, and tau is the triangle that kills this one cycle, right? Then the column R of tau, R of tau really stores exactly this one cycle that's, that's being created by sigma. And sigma is the, the, the highest simplex in the cycle. But the column B also has an intuitive interpretation. It's simply the chain, right? It's, it's exactly the, the two chain whose boundary is this blue, blue cycle. Right, just, just, just from the decomposition, right? Because V of tau multiplied by the, by the boundary gives you the R, R of tau. Um, and this picture is somehow suggestive, right? So if, if I wanted to get rid of this uh, wrinkle, right, of this mountain, I wanted to push it all the way down, then, well, it's it's not difficult to see that it's exactly this, this red cap that I have to push down. Now, in general, you should be very suspicious of this kind of intuition because things that are true in, in co-dimension one or in dimension zero, they never, never generalize to anything. But in fact, if you remember, if there is only one thing you remember from the stock, it should be this. In fact, it does generalize. So it's, it's always the case that, that the things that you need to move is going to be exactly the column uh, V of tau or maybe U of tau, depending on the situation. In some sense, this, this picture does generalize down to arbitrary dimension. So let, let, me, let me explain what, what I mean by this. And, and the, the very useful notion here is that of critical sense. So, so suppose that I have the following situation. I start. I have three simplices, tau one, tau two, tau three. They have values zero, a quarter, and three quarters. And somehow my loss tells me that I want to set the value of tau one to be one, right? So that's the only goal. 
which, which really means on the previous uh, formulation that tau one is paired with some sigma that defines the point in the persistence diagram. And I want to move that point from whatever is the value of sigma comma zero to whatever is the value of sigma comma one. Um, and so if you, if you just follow the gradient of this loss, right? Well, here it will tell you that, well, what you have to do, you have to increase the value of tau one. So you can go, 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 increase the value of tau one until it becomes equal to the value of tau two. Then there are two possibilities, right? If you switch the order, tau two becomes paired with sigma, and then it's tau two that I have to move, or it doesn't become paired with sigma. So if it doesn't become paired with sigma, then, then the situation doesn't change. But my loss tells me that I have to push uh, tau one to the right. But now if it does switch the pairing with, the, with tau three in this case, then actually what happens is that now I have to push them together, right? So I have to go in this direction, because if, I, if, if tau one comes, Second, right? It will be paired with sigma if tau three comes, or rather, first if tau three comes first, then it's paired with sigma. And so the point is that it's it's exactly sort of I have to go along this lower dimensional stratum, and um, in other words, I have to my final destination if I just follow the gradient is going to be tau one equals one, tau three equals one, and tau two stays in the quarter. So this is under the assumption that tau one and tau two don't change pairing, but tau one and tau three. So in, in the situation I call tau one and tau three the, the critical set. And these are the simplices that have to move, that have to move together. Um, and of course, if you know, a critical set is kind of a, an important uh, you know, set because if you know what it is, well, one, it tells you what is this final stratum that you have to move along, but two, it also tells you what your final destination is, right? If you can somehow from the beginning figure out what the critical set is, then you can take what I call the big step, right? From, from the beginning all the way to the end. So that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out what this critical set is and we're going to do it efficiently. Okay, now let me pause because I see some confused faces. Please ask questions because it's going to get worse from this point. <laughs> Jeremy. Why doesn't change? Oh, just, I, I, I decided that in this particular situation, it's not going to switch. So you can imagine, right? I mean, if tau two is a different connected component, just because their values are the same, the pairing is not going to change. Right? So it's, it's, only, it's only the simplices, right, where the pairing can switch to this that, that, that matter. Now, in order to make a big step, you know which critical set you would change, how do you know this up by what, what, a, what a great question, Pavel. Yes, I, I, that's, that's what we're going to figure out. Yes. Okay, Pavel. If it is like a transportation between these two methods, shouldn't like something that distance between these two things come near because it is like you have a distribution on the first row and then you would just want to move everything on tau one. Oh, so, sorry. This the fact the fact that these values sum up to one is a pu pure pure coincidence. Okay. Yes, I uh, <laughs> sorry. Add, add a hundred to everything, right? So, sorry. That's I mean that's good catch, but but my mistake. Um. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So let, let's do critical set again, but now in terms of filtration, because, because it's, uh, you know, second time is a charm or something, right? So, so the idea is that if we, so I have, have sigma paired with tau, and now let's say I'm decreasing the value of tau. And now the, the, if, if the simplex that immediately precedes tau is tau one, right? I need to figure out what happens after I, I transpose. If after, then there are two things that can happen, right? So. Either if I transpose them, tau remains paired with sigma, or if I transpose them, tau one becomes paired. With sigma. In the first case, the critical set doesn't change. In the second case, I have to add tau one to the critical set. And now I have to ask this question about the entire critical set, right? So I have some critical set xk minus one. There is some tau k. And the question is what happens if I move tau k to the right? right? Either it switches or it doesn't switch. Um, yeah, okay, so, so the definition is, is just recaps what it is. Um, and, and the definition is the same. So if it's, I, I gave it for, for the death, but it's the same for the birth, death, if the value is increasing or decreasing, it's always a, a contiguous set of simplices, such that if you take the first or the last, it's going to be paired with whatever is your target, so sigma in this case. Um, so critical set has a couple of properties that are important uh, to verify. Um, then, I mean, they, to me, they were counterintuitive, which is why maybe others they're not 
but uh, the, the first property is that if, that if we add the simplex to the critical set, other simplices don't fall out of it. So this, this follows simply from the fact that uh, the, whether sigma is paired with tau depends only on what simplices come up before sigma and between sigma and tau. And so if, if I add a simplex to the critical set from, from K2 to the critical set, this, the pair of sigma and tau is not going to be affected. And the opposite statement is also true that if I move a simplex past the critical set, right? So if I have some tau k, now I move it to the right and the pairing doesn't change, so it doesn't belong to the critical set, none of the simplices already in the critical set are going to fall out. Because you can imagine, right, that I removed something, suddenly something stopped being, stopped being critical in the sense, but it's, it's not difficult to verify that, that this is, um, yeah, that this, 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 this cannot happen. In other words, critical set can only grow. As I'm moving my simplex, some simplices will be added, 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 which is in, in the previous slide was the fact that we went on to lower and lower and lower um, dimensional strata. So because of this, you can imagine a very simple and very naive algorithm, which says that let's just simulate what we've been doing, right? Let's take our simplex to OK. Let's just keep dragging it through the filtration from, from whatever it started G to the target G prime. And every time I, I encounter a new simplex to OK, I will just transpose it. With, this, with, with everything in the critical set, and I will check what the pairing is. And I can perform these transpositions efficiently in, in linear time, and that's that sort of the algorithm. It's, it's not a good algorithm, it's, it's, it's slow, right? It's something like m squared n, where m is the number of simplices between where you start and where you want to end, and n is the size of k, but, but it's, it's an algorithm that sort of is easy to understand. Okay, so, so the main result that, that, that I want to sort of um, I wanted to, to get across today is that you can identify what the critical set is in linear time. And in fact, it's an incredibly simple algorithm. It's one that you can implement in you know, less time than it's taken me to talk so far. Uh, namely, the statement is the following, that if you're trying to increase the value of the, of the depth, so if you're trying to move tau to the right, you have to look at all the simplices between the G and G prime, so where you started and where you want to end, um, that have in the matrix U, Remember there was V and there was U was the inverse that lie in the row of tau and have a, have a non-zero in the row of tau. And if you're decreasing that, you have to do the same thing, but now you have to look at the column of V. So the picture that I was showing before where the column of V was, was playing the important role, this is true always, right, for, for any dimension. The only catch is that, so I mentioned that this, this R equals DV decomposition is not unique. Maybe I didn't mention, I should have mentioned, it's not unique. Now you know, um, but um, so so for, for this to, to, to work, you have to compute the matrices B and U that you get from the original this 3D reduction from so, um, I was doing the Lecher's emerging algorithm. And if you do this, then you will get matrices that tell you exactly. So if you look at the rows and, and columns, they tell you exactly what are the simplices in the critical set. In other words, what are the simplices that when the pairing when when you transpose them with your tau with your critical set. Uh, the pairing will switch. And of course, this is great because you can do this in your time, right? You just during. So, just to understand the circle, if we go back to that picture where you have the blue cycle here and then you have the, the red simplex closing, right? Yep. So, what you're doing is you're computing the red cache and you're computing it either starting from the top going down or you're computing it from the bottom going up. And the simplices that are included in the cap are your critical set. That's right. So, if, okay. if, if I want to move <laughs> tau down to sigma, then the, the red simplices is exactly the critical set. Right, so, okay, great. If I wanted to do something else, if I wanted to move it up, I would have to look at the inverse of V and it's, it's a little bit harder to visualize which is why I'm checking out, but yes, that's exactly it, right? So, so, the, so in this picture, the critical set is exactly in the red cap. And maybe another statement is also that if I didn't want to move tau all the way down to sigma, but only some part way down, then it's the red simplices up to that point, so at that color. So then your big step just corresponds to flattening just because it doesn't have That's right. Great. Great. So the deprivation you need to get the seven times of the Well, in this case, it is exactly the, the descending mechanism. Oh, yeah, but but in, in, in more general situation. So, so the problem is that here you don't have this interpretation. So, so the row, the, the reason I'm only I was only showing v is that u is a very counterintuitive kind of matrix. So it's it's sort of it's the 
synthesis whose reduction have touched tau, and they can be all over the place. So it's not, it's not, and you can imagine, right, that if I was trying to raise this mountain up, what I have to worry about are the other mountains that will, or the pairing will switch. Yeah. So it's it's not, yeah. Um, okay. So I, I I promised the proof, but I think I'm going to skip it because it's not a hard proof. But it's, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been talking about only about death so far. Now it's not sort of a fondness for morbidity or anything, right? But although in persistence, this is kind of a constant problem, right? You have to think about these things. Um, but it's just that, that with homology, what you do, when you do this with homology, you get, get that. But we also want to do birth, right? We also want to move the point uh, to change the birth value. And there's a very simple trick which makes life very easy. And the trick is the following, right? That if we, if we, if we switch from homology to cohomology, persistence pairing doesn't change, right? Just, just by duality. Except the role of birth and death changes, right? So if I have a, a homology, a, a cycle that's created at Ki that becomes zero at, at Kj, then there's going to be a co-cycle in Kj that by restriction will disappear past Ki. Right? So you get you get the same the same pairing, but slightly different interpretation. And um, some Years back, in fact, with Mikhail and, and with Vinny Silva, we showed that if you want to compute cohomology, there is a very you can use the same exact algorithms, but you have to replace the boundary matrix D that's ordered by um, by the filtration with a boundary matrix D bot, which is a sort of a transpose, but where the rows and columns are reordered by by filtration. So instead of going from one to n, they go from n down to one, and um, the, the statement that the pairing is the same really translates into the fact that if you have sigma paired with tau, in other words, there's a column of R tau whose lowest and zero is, is sigma, then in matrix R bot, you're going to have a column R sigma whose lowest non zero is going to be in row of tau, right? So that's it, if and only. But now let's think of what it is that I showed in the previous sort of slide, except I skipped the proof. I said that if you want to move tau um, down, you have to look at the column of V tau. It was purely a matrix kind of operation, right? But if I want to decrease the value of tau, in other words, move the column to the left, I have to look at the, at the, uh, the column V tau. Well, if I want to move sigma to the left, which in this case means moving its value up, right? Because the filtration is, is, is an opposite direction, then by the same, literally by the same argument, I have to look at this V bot uh, sigma. In other words, there's there's nothing else. It's it's exactly we, we already know everything. Duality buys us a great deal for free. So just to summarize this, right? Uh, if you are increasing death, you would be looking at u tau, so the row of tau in u increasing. If you are decreasing death, you would be looking at the column of v of tau. Now, if you want to decrease birth, you are looking at u bot of sigma. If you want to this would decrease birth, and if you wanted to increase birth, you look at v bot of, of sigma. In other words, these matrices. V U and V bot U bot tell you everything you need to know to compute the critical sets. So there is there is kind of nothing else to worry about. Um, except there is one more thing to worry about, namely these faces of cofaces, which I haven't said anything about, right? Because if you're moving simplex tau or the critical set, then if you're moving it to the left, then in order to maintain the filtration, you have to take into account all of the faces, right? If you're moving it down, the faces have to come before the cofaces. And so you cannot transpose, right? You cannot move a simplex before its face. So you you, ha you have to identify all the faces or cofaces. You could do this in um, this time um, O of dm, where m is the number of simplices um, in, in your critical set. But in fact, this is not even necessary. Uh, in practice, you can ignore this because what you're actually doing, right? You, you, you're, you're saying that the critical set will have to move, the values will have to move from D to D prime, but then you're going to back propagate this through your, whatever is your function, back to your data, then you will update your data, and then you will reconstruct the function, you will do, create a new filtration, and that will enforce for you that actually the faces come before the cofaces and you have, you have everything nice and, nice and clean. So this, it's not, the, the, the savings are not so much computational, it's, it's much easier to implement, you don't have to worry about it. So that's a that's a useful thing. Okay, so to summarize, the algorithm is, is, is very simple. Um, if you have some matching, you know, if you have your loss expressed as a matching uh, called M, 
then uh, and, and you're trying yeah you're trying to move points from, from P, uh, pi to qi then for each pi and qi you identify the critical set for for, for the birth for the sigma uh, you identify the critical set for the death so depending on, on which way you're moving you're looking at one of the other matrix and now um, you record the values for the synthesis in, in this in this array target because now you have a problem right so if, you, if you're no longer working with a singleton loss so where you're just moving one point if you're moving a bunch of points you have conflict right because one point wants to move a simplex to one place another point wants to move simplex to another place you have to keep track of this and then the, the heuristic that we we use this uh you just take whoever wants to move it the furthest win, wins so you take the maximum displacement but actually if you if you also do um this is motivated if you if you're doing zero dimensional simplification, it's, it's exactly the right thing to do. Uh, but we also tried the averaging, and nothing nothing really changed um, in any kind of meaningful way. And then this gives you the loss, and this is what so for every simplex, you know, suddenly you get a bunch of information on where where it needs to go. Okay, so um, we implemented this. We did some um, experiments. So the first is um, this uh, quadrant loss, right, where you you have a bunch of points. And you're trying to move them out of the quadrant, and the data comes from um, you know, from some simulation of magnetic reconnection. Um, so let me let me explain what these plots are. So this is this is a vineyard plot, right? So we have um, we keep track of how the points are moving, and we project it onto two onto two views. The first one is the birth plus death persistence plane. So in other words, kind of view from the top down. And the other one is here's the step number, so how many steps we took, and this is persistence, right? So, so it's a two two views on the same thing, and this is the the, the usual the standard algorithm we call diagram method, and uh, maybe the point right, and the color is simply the step number, so so it always goes from from purple to yellow, and in this view it's helpful because you can see that you know, where the point started versus where they end up. Maybe the point of this of this plot is that. Um, not all of them, so in 50 steps, not all of them reach the quadrant, right? So they, they, you, you don't completely simplify this. On the other hand, if you use what I described, the critical set method, then in fact, it takes a much less than 50 steps. Everything <coughs> shoots down, shoots outside of the quadrant. Although what you see also, right, is that not all the points are following the kind of straight lines to the closest point. They had other points are pushing them in different directions. And another way to, to look at this is uh, to look at the loss, right? So in other words, just to visualize what this loss is using two different methods, um, the diagram method and the, and the critical set method, and just to keep keep track of it over the steps. And uh, so this plot, I guess, shows you immediately that if you use the diagram method, right, it's it, it sort of the loss decays very slowly. If you use momentum, you get better performance, but still comparatively slow, whereas the critical set method, the thread curve, I mean, it just shoots down, right? Because it takes a whole bunch of synthesis at once and it just pushes them all, all down. And um, maybe another thing that's, that's kind of interesting here is that although for the diagram method, the momentum helps a great deal, right? The difference between blue and purple is, is quite large. Uh, for the critical set method, it's, it's much less, less significant, right? So going from red to green is, is not quite, quite as dramatic. So another example is, is simplification, right? So where we're just trying to get rid of all the points now in the one-dimensional persistence diagram. So this is the case that we don't know how to treat theoretically. Um, and so this is the diagram method. So I guess here the idea is that all these guys should go to zero. But the fact that you see yellow in this slice means that not all of them reach the diagonal. But on the other hand, if you follow the critical set method, then Everything just shoots down to the diagonal, right? So everything immediately—it's it's a much, much steeper decline. You, you you simplify virtually everything, and it's completely obvious from the from the loss plots. Because so this is a logarithmic scale. The uh, the diagram loss, uh, the diagram method keeps the loss. You know, it, it gets to I don't know, ten to negative two or something, whereas the critical critical set method is much better. And with momentum, it really shoots down. You can drive it as far down as you. As you can in very few steps. Uh, what's also interesting is, I mean, if you, if you do these kinds of optimization algorithms, the, the usual pain is to play with the learning rate because it's somehow everything is very dependent on the learning rate. You tell. So, uh, in the previous diagram here, uh, the yellow line uh, is the high yeah. amount of crystal sets. Right. So, so I, 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 right. So, good, good eye. 
Um, I don't have much to say, but other than the fact that it's critical, so if momentum is crucially useful, crucially important for the diagram loss, but for the critical set method, if you crank it up, it somehow starts overshooting, right? Because it's it, the critical set already tells you where to go, and if you maintain too much of the momentum from the previous step, it, it somehow just hurts you. And like with the with the diagram losses, as much you can crank, the more you crank it up, the better off, off you are. Yeah, and um, right. So so the uh, picture here is that on the let's see. So the task is we, we want to simplify the function to some prescribed value. We want to bring loss down to some prescribed value. We vary the learning rate, which is what's on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we track how many steps we have to take. Um, and sort of you see that the, the, the sort of the, the diagram, the diagram um, method uh, does OK. But for high learning rate, actually, momentum hurts it as well. So this, is, this was your question, I guess, Mikhail, right? Oh, your, your question was about the critical set, right? Uh, and the critical set performs much, much better. And in fact, sort of, you get roughly 10x fewer steps required for the for, for this compared to the diagram. So if you want to do this in, in practice, right, this this, this buys you buys you quite a bit. Um, okay, so so some final final thoughts that um, I guess um, need to be said. Uh, the biggest shortcoming of this method, right? So in, in the previous slides, I showed everything in terms of number of steps. Which should make you very suspicious, right? Because if I, if I wanted to be you know, for full disclosure, I would be showing you running times, but I'm showing you steps. And um, the reason is that, of course, to, to compute the critical set, you have to compute these matrices B and B bot, which requires more time to compute than just the matrix R. Um, but it's not it's not that much. Well, the matrix U is is essentially free because you're just recording what what operations you were doing in the, in the other matrices. Um, and so, in the experiments that I was showing, the the Amount of time taken per step is about four times slower. So with ten times fewer steps, you're still winning, but it's not it's not quite quite as, as impressive. Um, here there is some hope. Uh, there is a very recent work by uh, Bruno and Nelson. On this idea of if you compute persistence and then you change the filtration a little bit, you want to recompute persistence, you want to update it. They give a very simple algorithm that um, that updates persistence. Uh, from from R equals DVD decomposition. So in other words, they do need the matrix V, but it's significantly faster. And so you get the matrix V for free. The only problem is that what you get from their method doesn't give you the greedy reduction. It's not the same decomposition as, as you get from the LZ algorithm. And so there's an open question how to go, how to improve that so that you can get, you can get that. Um, the second observation I wanted to point out is that knowing about this V and, and V bot uh, you have some flexibility in how you define your matching. So, for example, if you wanted to push the point to the diagonal, I just showed this situation, right, where you match point to the closest point on the diagonal. But of course, you could have pushed instead of going to, to the average, you could have gone to birth comma birth, or you could have gone to death comma death. And then in this situation, right, if you go to birth birth, you only need matrix V because you're only decreasing the, the death value. In this situation, you only need matrix V bot, so you get a lot of you get a lot of room to play with these kind of things, which is which is also something that you can you can take into account when, when designing what you're doing. Um, and the final remark, and I think I think the most interesting open question is how to couple this tighter with the optimizers, because when you when you do optimization, right, there are all these things that you have to worry about and play with, like figuring out the learning rates, figuring out you know, how how to take the step size the right step sizes. Um, but here, from from the critical side, you get a lot of information. You know how far you can go for any given loss, how, how far you can take a step where where it's sort of safe, where, where you know that, that, that things will behave the way you expect them. And so, and so, figuring that out is is maybe a, an important open question. And well, what Mikhail asked sort of how does this all relate to momentum? Why does it behave one way in the diagram method, another way in the critical set method? I think is is also a major open question. But unfortunately, I have nothing to say about this. So on that note, I will stop and I thank you for your time and attention. Can you explain some more about why the matrix composition is not because that would seem to give you a degree of flexibility that you can use in the implementation, but I so, so the, the reason the decomposition is not unique uh, is that 
you can imagine that I take this column, I add it to this column, my lowest non zeros haven't changed. And yet I got something else. So the statement is that the composition is not unique, but the lowest non zero will always be the same as long as the matrix R is reduced. Yeah, and, and, and the problem is that it, it doesn't, in fact, it constrains you. So, so you're right that, that the, the non uniqueness in every other situation buys you a lot of freedom. But in this situation, because we have to have these matrices that come from this beauty deduction, it constrains us because if we get the update from some other method, we can't use them. The, the, the columns will be different and therefore they won't tell us what the critical sets are. So, so what that would do is it would uh, if you're looking at the single tables, right? And so if you use one of these predictive composition, what would happen is you applied the same algorithm using your matrices, but you would be moving multiple disjoint sets at the same time. That's right. So you can imagine if I had some other wrinkle somewhere here, right? So I had some some bump over here. I could add its column, you know, this cycle to this cycle. Nothing would change in terms of the pairing, in terms of the composition. But now my column of V would have this cap and another cap. So this has to do with trying to make the individual operation because you're, you're thinking about some just single to loss. I think it's possible. That's right. Yes. Okay. Other question? Thank you, Dimitri. Thanks. We have five minutes, right? You have five minutes, yeah. Okay. Uh, they mentioned the yes. Search for the data. It reminds me a lot of the um, uh, um, you know, difference between interior optimization methods and the software problems. How will, oh, oh, so yeah, do you know how to connect to my English? Uh, is that's it right, right. yeah, to the interior. No, this is a full one. Uh, no, I want to, I have cables. I want to connect, I have the, 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 the so I will put my slide here. Oh, because he connects his computer. But where? Uh, Dimitri, I, I have cable. Okay, let's see. Dimitri, where did you hook up your computer? Where do you connect? You open this. <laughs> and there's, there should be. Yeah, so if you find out what is this. Yeah. This is a power cell. So, oh, ah, yeah, but that's oh, not the point. I will connect the, the, the tablet to. Does it have Wi Fi? Yes. I can use it. Uh, I can yeah. connect through Wi Fi. Yeah, so I send you the, the link to the room. You can also I would have sent you the But you send us yeah. by, uh, via email. Yeah, yeah but, I, but, but I send you. Yeah, that's the same one. From me, uh, look, yeah. yeah, so I connect and then, and then you can just share. share. Ah, yeah. okay. uh, continue. So, so join the video. No, okay, got it. Got it. No, no, I have done something wrong. Okay, no, 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 so I joined the meeting. Yes. And okay, I do it the universe again. is yeah. not, not one more. Right? Can, so can you bring your speakers um, down? And then yes. So I joined with video. Video. Oh, no. Without video. Without video. Okay. Without video. Okay. And? No, no audio. No audio because my voice is caught by. Voice will be going from the mic. Uh, okay, that's, that's all. Now I am. Uh, I say you say whatever you want to show. Yeah, yeah. I should have some. Okay, share content. Uh, screen. Yes, hello. Yeah. Well, so it's, it's really easy to prevent you weren't happy out there. Oh, 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 thank you. And, um, and, and it was really okay. hard for two okay. hours. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was finished sharing, but I want to share it. Well, yeah, so I mean, it should pop up this. Yeah, okay. Okay. okay.
Go ahead. Uh, I want to close this. No, fuck. Um, no, let's just go back to what you do. Okay, okay, I understood. Yeah, I want to take it away because. Uh, Okay. We still have three minutes, right? Yeah. Thanks for working. Oh, yes, we need to stop and start recording. We have to have a heavy Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's working fine. Okay, so it's working fine. And just let it. Just. 